Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alexa Von Tobel. And this week, I'm excited for you to meet Julie Rice, co-founder of Peoplehood, a guided group conversation practice designed to create new relational habits. Julie's lifelong work had been about building community. She's best known for co-founding the fitness phenomenon, SoulCycle. She started the company in 2006 and served as its co-CEO until 2015, growing from a small bike dance studio of 60 studios to attracting Equinox as a buyer and exit. After SoulCycle, she served as partner at WeWork, focusing on brand and experience. Julie has been named as one of the most creative people in business by Fast Company and was honored as a brand genius by Adweek. Julie lives in New York City with her husband and their two daughters. She's a board member of the Public Theater and Weight Watchers. She's also a friend. And with that, let's welcome Julie. Um, Let's start with the basics. What's peoplehood? And what was the thesis behind peoplehood? So peoplehood is a guided group conversation practice. Um, We designed a 55-minute experience that helps people get to know themselves and each other better. When Elizabeth and I started SoulCycle, we really thought we were starting an exercise company. People were coming because they wanted to lose a little weight or fit into some jeans or get in better cardiovascular shape. But the truth is what we found pretty quickly was that they came for one thing, but they actually came back for something different. And that was really the connection that they found with other people in the room the connection that they found um, with themselves, and really the way that it made them feel to be supported by a group of people. And so it's interesting because as, you know, we have become a world of digital overuse, we've gone through a global pandemic, Elizabeth and I really started to think about the fact that people don't have the spaces, they don't have the skills, and they certainly don't have the structure in place to have conversations that really allow people to grow closer to each other. And so we really began to think about what would it look like to create spaces and experiences like that. And, you know, what's really fascinating is this week, you know, the Surgeon General put out a report talking about how we as a country are really in a loneliness epidemic, not unlike an opioid epidemic or, you know, things that we have seen that have really affected the health of our nation When we look at the statistics that are out there, we can see that social isolation is really causing more physical damage to people than smoking 15 cigarettes a day, than obesity. You know, it's it's really crazy. And yet somehow we have not yet sort of inserted this piece of how do we take care of our social relational health into our 360 wellness pictures. When I started SoulCycle, you know, people really, exercise was not lifestyle yet. People really were thinking about like, it was on my to-do list. It wasn't something I enjoyed. And I think one of the great things about SoulCycle is we really helped build this category of, you know, exercise as lifestyle. And people now really understand I need to work out a certain amount, right, to keep myself healthy. We understand that we need to eat green vegetables. We understand we need to have a certain amount of sleep. Thankfully, our mental health has come into the forefront, but then there's this missing piece, right, of how we take care of the relationships in our lives, because ultimately, um, it's really who we love and who loves us and the way we feel heard and understood that create the quality of the lives that we have. Why do you think we're in this loneliness epidemic? How do we end up here? You know, I think it's so many things. It's interesting, right? Because people were really built to take care of each other. Different people in the community got the food, different people cooked it, different people took care of the children. You know, it was really a, you know, a community is really meant to take care of each other's needs. And we have had so many things that have contributed to it. But I think what has really put us over the edge is social media, the insane amount of digital usage that we um, are all participating in. And of course, then we added a global pandemic to it. And now, I mean, it's more than just being disconnected. I mean, we're really polarized. And that is, that's a real issue. I mean, you look at dinner tables, people don't talk to each other anymore. Everybody brings their phone to the table. I look at my kids, I have two different daughters and they are six years apart in age. And even in that six year age gap, I notice the way that they each consume media is entirely different, right? My little one doesn't sit through a half an hour TV show. That's way too long for her. 
I mean, YouTube has become too long for her, right? Because TikTok's so much faster. My big one can sit through 30 minutes of television, but, you know, still she's on her phone a lot. But even in that six years to watch sort of that is, is so amazingly different. We have stripped our social instincts out of our society. It's like anything else. It's like, you know, it's like anything else that you don't practice, right? And that's why we've been calling it relational fitness at Peoplehood because it's like building any other muscle. You wouldn't go to the gym one time and think like, okay, I'm in shape forever. I mean, if we didn't look at our phones every minute of every day, we would eventually deprogram ourselves. But instead of spending time looking at each other, we're spending time looking at our phones. What did you learn was the most important thing that made SoulCycle work? that you're pulling forward? Look, you know, Elizabeth and I build companies that are about people. Uh, And I think that has always been our thesis and it continues to be the thesis that we operate anything we build on. I mean, Elizabeth and I have always said, you know, let's build companies that we would like our daughters to work at. And I think that really is what I learned at SoulCycle. The thesis for me is that people just want to matter. People want to feel like someone cares if they're there, if they're not there. Customers showed up, and when you knew their name or you remembered their shoe size, it was like you had bought them a new car. They were so surprised and impressed that in you know, a big city or wherever they were in the country, somebody remembered something about them. Employees, I say this all the time to people, you know, you don't have to give somebody a raise or a promotion, but you do need to take the time to look at somebody and let them tell you how they feel about something. People just want to feel heard. They want to feel like they matter. And I think at SoulCycle, we spent a lot of time, Elizabeth and I spent a lot of time working with a coach to learn how to communicate with each other. And then we spent a lot of time teaching the organization, you know, all of the things that we were learning with our coach, I like to say, you know, we really grew up with our employees. You know, we became leaders and we taught our employees how to lead as we were all doing it together. And so I think the through line for me is always that, you know, if you take the time to recognize people, if people feel like they matter, um, it's really something that creates a successful business and also a successful workplace. Talk a little bit about, like, let's let every listener mentally walk through peoplehood. Go. What does that look like? Absolutely. So let me just start off by saying, like, we love therapy, but that's not what we do here. Um, This is really a peer-to-peer experience. You know, you come to peoplehood either virtually, um, because we do have a fantastic online product at peoplehood.com, or in our flagship 17th Street location, and you come in. We go into our gather rooms and we start off by um, closing our eyes and doing a little bit of breath work. And we do it to great music and it doesn't feel super woo-woo. It feels modern and it feels relaxing. But it also, again, talking about sort of the science of, you know, how it feels to be in a collaborative space. You know, we lower our stress level. We get into the mindset of being open to hearing ourselves differently and hearing other people differently. And once we kind of cross that threshold and settle in, we begin to share in a group setting. Um, And we go around a circle and we start with something very simple. We usually ask people, what's one thing that's true for you today? And you can say, hi, I'm Alexa. And, um, you know, I had a hard time getting my kids out the door this morning. Or, you know, you can say, you know, hi, I'm Julie, and I'm feeling like a bad mom because I've been working too much lately, right? Um, You can go any way that you want to go with it. And then we get into the heart of what we do at Peoplehood, which we call higher listening. And, you know, we have studied with many different people. We've been doing this research for three years now, and we have studied with authors and professors and scientists and rabbis and priests and AA leaders. And really, if we could teach people just one thing that would change the way that they exist in the world, it would be to teach people how to listen to each other. If we could learn how to listen to each other differently, we would change the dynamics of all of the relationships that we are in. Um, I don't know about you, but most conversations, especially ones where I really have a point of view, it's like I come to the conversation and it's really not a dialogue. It's just two monologues, right? At Peoplehood, we teach people how to hire listen, and that means we go into pairs, and the listener has three minutes just to listen to what the sharer is saying, and the sharer has three minutes to listen to the listener. Um, I should go backward, and I should say there's a guide that takes you through this experience, and the guide sets an intention for the day. So, you know, we could be talking about what's keeping you up at night. We could be talking about imposter syndrome. We could be talking about success. We could be talking about money. 
Um, but whatever the theme is for the day, we're going to go into two different breakouts with our partners where we each have three minutes to talk and three minutes to listen, and then we switch. And we answer a couple of really interesting questions that the guide will ask you. Um, and then we go around. And the final piece of it, again, in our last round is we do what we call a recognition round. And that's where we really talk about what we saw in somebody else in the room that really resonated with us. And, you know, the thing about peoplehood that's so amazing is there's personal catharsis. So often we ask people how they're doing and then we cut them off or we ask them a question and then we respond. But when somebody has just three minutes to process their own thoughts, it's shocking how they begin to peel the layers of their own onion. There comes a moment where you see a light bulb go on in somebody's face where they've answered their own question. And then by practicing this over and over, you begin to take this pause, this listening into your life. And what we're hearing from people is that conversations are changing at the dinner table when they're doing this week after week. They're leading meetings differently um, with their teams because they are all of a sudden, they're stepping back, they're taking this pause um, and people around them are feeling heard. Talk a little bit about the recipe of the guides and how you're thinking, and obviously it'll evolve, um, but you you nailed the recipe of the instructor at SoulCycle, and now you get to bring that to the guides. So talk a little bit about the guides. You know, as a second time founder, hustling every day to get customer by customer in here, um, you forget how hard it is to be in startup life. But I really have, even in the eight weeks that we've been open so far, I, I had the aha moment the other day. It was like, oh, I've got to even teach people what this is before they're going to be able to understand how to use it, right? It's such, an, it's such a new idea and yet such a simple idea, an idea that should be so obvious to us. But it was the same thing with SoulCycle, right? I mean, our big complicated thesis was joy through movement. I mean, that was it, right? Why should it have to be awful? I mean, we don't give ourselves 10 hours a day to release stress, to see a friend, to feel uplifted, to listen to music. So why couldn't those be the things that SoulCycle brought us, right? Why couldn't we have all of those things in the one hour that we gave to ourselves? And the last thing I will say to you is like, you know, for a long time, expressing your emotions, stigmatized, you know? A lot of people and a lot of communities feel like, they should just suck it up. Happy enough is fine. People are isolated. They don't know where to go to express themselves. And for me, I feel like if we can bring this, you know, to the street front and we can have a cool coffee shop and hoodies and a brand that makes people think that, you know, finding new friends and being nice to the people around you is sexy, like I'm all for that. And again, I think it's a gateway drug and I see it happening in these rooms. We go around for the first time and share and people hear their own voices and they are startled by how powerful that is for them, how there's so much going on in their own heads that they don't say out loud and just having somebody be a witness to that is really powerful for people. Okay, let's get into the guides. You know, we're calling our guides super connectors, right? They're empaths. They're willing to share their own stories first. Um, they can read the room and understand, you know, how people need to be supported, you know, in that room. They're good at connecting people. And so that's really what we're looking at. Um, you know, people that have held space for other people, all of our guides go through, a, you know, a training program that we've created. Uh, they've all come from some sort of a profession where they have held space for others, whether they have been teachers of something or instructors or AA leaders or however all of those things have been. But really, all of the people that um, hold space here ha do have experience doing that. When you think about the long-term business model, you've got the B2C, D2C directly coming in off the street into the physical locations. Tell us a little bit about what you think the digital platform is going to look like and how you want to build that out. It really feels, you know, we keep saying that, you know, our peoplehood sanctuaries both physically and digitally are sort of like modern day community centers. And that's kind of what it feels like. Um, you know, we've created something that feels different enough than Zoom that I think it feels like you're having a different experience. We worked really hard to make sure that, you know, the user experience from, you know, being able to purchase a gather right on through to when you, when you end and come back for more are pretty seamless. Uh, and I think the room digitally feels really intimate. And so we're all students of consumer trends. And so I think, you know, just like every other business out there, you know, in 2023, you need to meet people where you are. And so I personally think, you know, consumers want to touch things physically. They want to be in physical experiences, but all of our scale will ultimately come digitally. I think unlike SoulCycle, we will probably build you know, the way I see the roadmap looking is we'll probably build five or six of these in the next few years. And then 
We'll be running gathers every hour on the hour, you know, hopefully more than one of them on our digital platform and people will be able to gather from wherever they are. Um, and so we've been, we've gone into quite a few companies already to your point of B2B and we have found that the product works really well for, um, we, we have kicked off a lot of great offsites, really is a great start to any sort of company offsite. You know, we're working with teams within companies to do either, you know, weekly meetings, monthly meetings. Um, you know, leaders are finding that this product is really helping their teams to do exactly what you said, get to know each other, get to re-know each other. Um, it's a great product for onboarding. There are just so many people that have been hired during this pandemic that just teams just don't know each other. I mean, we have really run out of gas in the tank. We are right at that moment where... Um, remote work is convenient, but we've been doing it for long enough that the you know there, there's not a lot of money in the bank for people at this point, and so we really need to reestablish these relationships. You clearly have a deep, passionate commitment that you think we as a society something is breaking. Give us a little bit of the prediction that you see in your in the back of your head that's kind of driving you to run at this. One hundred percent. Listen, people describe their self-care routines. And when I describe my self-care routines, like my self-care routines are my communities. You know, whether it's the seven moms that I have raised my 18-year-old daughter with, you know, we, we, we start every day with a group chat and end it. And I, I live for our monthly dinners where we, you know, we get to just talk about all the things. Um, you know, yesterday I was feeling wildly depleted. I've been running like a crazy person working so hard. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to make an hour because I have three friends that are having lunch and I'm going to go meet them. And I can only tell you how that recharges me. Um, you know, I'm lucky to have an incredible husband, um, who really uh, fills my cup and a great family. And even building SoulCycle, I will say, you know, SoulCycle really turned like big cities into small neighborhoods. You know, I will say that it was incredible. Um, so I, I will say for me, community is literally where my happiness lies. And I have seen it have such a profound effect on me as a human being that I am sure that this is, you know, what we need to put back into our lives. I have no doubt that this is what is happening in the world, Alexa. I'm a pretty good uh, trend spotter. And I will tell you that this is going to happen. People need new third spaces. People need help making friends, keeping relationships, bonding with teams, all of the things. Somebody's going to figure this out. I hope more people than just me figure it out because we need a lot of help. I mean, it would be great to move not just from loneliness, but then we can move on to, you know, helping fix polarization. We can actually coexist with people that have different opinions than we do. I mean, once we get past isolation, we can start to work on conflict. I mean, that's the whole next level of all of this. And, you know, without sounding too lofty, it's like, you know, first we change the conversations at our dinner tables, and then we change them in our offices, and then in our cities, and then in our world. And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Julie, I want to transition a little bit to you. And for everybody out there listening, you are a repeat founder. It's almost scarier the second time. The first time, it's sort of naive. You're like, all right, here we go. But jumping back into the ring in peoplehood, I just want to hear a little bit about that emotional journey for you and kind of what compelled you finally to be like, I got to go do this. For me, you know, what called me back into the ring is there was something else that I needed in the world, you know, and I, I think that Elizabeth and I, again, we just, we create things that we want to use that we need. I think this was once again, sort of a calling for us, just like SoulCycle was. I can tell you that I think it's so much harder this time. The first time I had no expectations. So, you know, we wrote our business plan on the back of the napkin at Starbucks and said that if we had 75 people that came a day, we were going to be thrilled, right? We would pay um, for some childcare because we both had tiny babies at the time and uh, we'd be able to pay our rent and keep the bikes in good shape and each take home a little bit of money to justify going to work every day. But this time around, you know words like scale and exit and raise and capital and, uh, you know, there are words that I never even knew existed before and it is very hard. I keep saying it's like, it's almost like you almost need to turn off your peripheral vision, you know, because you can really only look forward. And I will say that it is so hard as a second time entrepreneur that has seen a lot of success to really try and focus on what it feels like to make one customer 
happy, to turn one user into an evangelist. Because that's what really it is, right? Once you start turning one user into an evangelist and they start to tell their friends, you know you're on to something. But when you're focusing on getting to 100,000 users or millions of followers on social, you're losing the plot. You really are. And listen, I'll be the first person to admit it. Some days I lose the plot. I will tell you that when we, when we were going out to raise money, I've never had such a soul crushing experience because in the morning you're pitching your great idea that you're so confident about to people who may or may not think it's a good idea at all. And then in the afternoon, you have to come home and execute on that vision that that morning people told you was a terrible idea. But I do think there is so much self-doubt just because you know so much. I hate to say that ignorance is bliss, but the first time around, I remember closing the door the first time we had 30 people in the room and every bike was full. And I remember thinking like, we did it. There are 30 people in this room. Like I have somebody and not my friend or my mom on every single bike in that room. 30 people paid for this, right? And it was a miracle. Like I, I was so happy. And then you keep moving the goalpost, of course, and you keep moving the finish line. And then starting over is really, um, I, I would say that most days I end in a crisis of confidence. If you look back in the rearview mirror, what did your parents do that you do with your own kids? Because it, it left such a dent in you. My parents really loved me unconditionally, which is quite a gift for a child. I, you know, I don't know if I ever appreciated it at the time, but it never really mattered. Well, first of all, let me start off by saying I was always a very self-motivated person, which I think is a lot of DNA anyway. I'm not sure where that even came from. My parents are both pretty chill, but I always kind of was that way as a kid. I always liked a project. I always liked to read. Um, I was I was like a theater kid. I always loved to be part of a production, a collaboration. I always loved to be in the center of things. But I will say my parents really did love me unconditionally. It didn't matter what grade I brought home. It didn't matter if I was the lead in the play or if I was the third tree on the left. It didn't matter if I was sitting on the bench for the soccer game or I got up and scored. My parents just always thought that I was it. I mean... They just really found me to be fabulous all the time. And they kind of let me know it. And they just sort of let me do my own thing. I was never overparented, but I always had parents that were there for me. One of the things I admire most about you, which I've never said to you, is that you really have a powerful brand building eye. And you really do. I mean, it's like, where do you think that brand building skill set comes from? Just, just in your own language and feel free to compliment yourself because it really is something so special. Soul Cycle crushed it. Where does it come from? What does that look like? How do you describe that? Yeah, you know, the best way that I can describe it is I'm like, I'm a really crazy consumer. I actually think it's, it starts with a shopping addiction and I'm not even being funny. Um, it's not even so much that I like to buy so much, but I love to see things. I love to touch things. I love to experience things. I love, to, I love fonts. I love colors. I love to look at things. And I'm a really good collector of taking tidbits of what is going on in the zeitgeist and stringing them together. I'm really just a good curator of the zeitgeist is what it is. I am fascinated by what is going on in the world in terms of brands and what people are wanting to consume and, and own and experience. Okay. Building a company is stressful. Talk about, again, a, a skill set that I actually think we all need to get better at, which is self-regulation, stress management. What's yours? What are your tips? Give us a trick or two as a second time founder and being a little bit older and having done this before, the one benefit of it that I will say is, you know, I've run a big company. Um, when things seem like they're on fire, the fire does not seem quite as hot as it did the last time around. What I really do try to do is um, I do try to, believe it or not, I celebrate Shabbat on Friday nights. I started doing this when I was running a very big company. Why? I'm not the most religious person in the world, but um, I did have a good friend who was a CEO of a very big company, and she told me that she did it. And she was a big music executive who had to go out almost every night of the week to um, see different shows. And she said that was like her one non-negotiable. And on Friday nights, you know, um, my kids who have very little responsibilities, they don't, they don't clean their rooms and they don't do a lot around the house, but everybody knows Friday night, um, we're all around the table and we light candles, and we put our phones away, and there is something just about that night where we all sit there for a long time. My parents come, 
my mom, my husband's mother comes. There's just something about being around a table with my family on this one night a week in my pajamas on a Friday that is so restorative for me. Those couple of hours where we just have no place to be or go. That really, for me, is a huge, huge piece of my week. I find that that really recharges me. I love that. Yeah, it's really awesome. Building anything like that into your week is a fantastic thing. Of course, there's always soul cycle. I still soul cycle, and I, I do have to say I still find joy and magic and clarity on the bike. And then I will say that I have a fantastic husband um, who is a real partner in life, who is supportive and um, enthusiastic and um, loves to do things with me, but also loves to support the things that I like to do. And so I do think that having somebody like that who's really, you know, there, it's also a real form of self-care. I want to move to the quick fire rounds because otherwise I could talk to you for five hours. I'm going to ask you a question. First thing that comes to your mind, what gets you out of bed every day? My little daughter yelling that she doesn't know what to wear. Mom, I don't know what to wear. Get out of bed. (laughs) (laughs) That's so cute. Biggest pinch me moment that you had at SoulCycle? God, there were so many, but I do have to say that, you know, celebrating Oprah's birthday at our West Hollywood location was pretty amazing. And what's so amazing was I used to say to Elizabeth in the very early days, like, I swear one day Oprah's going to put us on her show and she's going to interview us. And then the show ended before we ever got made SoulCycle big enough. So I remember the day that they called and said she wanted to have her birthday party in SoulCycle. And that was a real moment. A quote you live by, a quote that you love. Well, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the quote that you gave me the other day when I was complaining about, um, you know, is being open for eight weeks and saying that I I was so unsure of myself and is this business ever going to happen? And you quoting Alexa von Tobel back to Alexa von Tobel said, "It takes a decade." It's so true, Julie. That's the one thing, and just let that be your north star. That by seven years in, it's going to be clicking, and by eight years, you're like, "It's wow," and ten years, you're like holy smokes, look what we built. But you're eight weeks in, so we got to make sure, you know, we, we remind you of what you're capable of. Keep it going. A favorite book, a book that has made an impact on your life. It doesn't have to be a business book, any book. You know, I love The Alchemist. I will say sometimes I reread it just to remind myself that, you know, we're all on a journey. Is there an interview question that you like or rely on that helps you really better understand the heart of who somebody is? For me, it's, it's always more of an internal question. And I also think something that I've really learned as a founder is the right question is different for everyone. You know, I usually ask myself, like, is this a person that will stay overnight with me to get the work done? You know, I do ask people things like that, wildly unpopular things like, do you answer my text at 11 o'clock at night? Because especially in startup life, I think that I'm a person that's in the trenches And I think it's important to understand who's going to be in the trenches. And you know what? I also understand that not everybody wants to answer a text at 11 o'clock at night. But the thing is, I also think it's good to know who you are. I think it's good to know what type of people work best in an organization. And, um, you know, we really try to create an organization where people um, are, are treated really well, but we really all work hard together to make things happen. Last question is one category of innovation that you're most excited about right now can be anything. Something that I am really actually excited about is, um, you know, I sit on the board of Weight Watchers. We have recently decided to, you know, go into the area of weight loss pharmaceuticals. And I do think that if people are using them in the right way for obesity, chronic illness, and diabetes, they can be a very helpful tool for people. Um, And it will be really interesting to see um, how we use that new science to help cure a really huge issue in our country and our world. Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. Not only are we rooting for you, I mean this from the bottom of my heart, thank God people like you exist to go work on this issue that every parent in America is aware of and worried about. Every human in America, we see the disconnection of our society and that is not who we are as as species and we gotta fix it. So I'm just so grateful and we are all rooting for you so much with Peoplehood and we've just been blown away by your career. So thank you so much. And everybody out there, if you wanna check out Peoplehood, head to peoplehood.com. You can bring it into your companies, you can share it or you can go and attend if you're in New York City today. And you can join us next week for Ink the Founders Project with Alex Von Tobel. 